from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Glad to have you along with us. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead today, K-State's Dan O'Brien with his weekly segment on the grain market trends. He'll size up the USDA's latest grain export sales numbers, as well as what the current carry in the grain futures markets is telling you producers from a marketing standpoint. Also, K-State's Joel DeRussi will look at managing cattle through the negative effects of these lingering muddy conditions in our feeding areas and what you producers can do to shore up those feedlots in particular as those unfavorable conditions persist. And speaking of the weather, we'll visit once again, as we do on a Friday, with K-State's Mary Knapp on the Kansas Agricultural Weather Outlook. All this and more right here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Thanks for listening in to this Agriculture Today. Well, the grain futures markets this past week were decidedly bearish. Is there anything out there that will turn these markets around? We'll bring that question up to our guest, Dan O'Brien. Joins us every Friday, does Dan, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. Dan, you're going to suggest that this might not be all that grim, what's going on with the markets, and we'll dig into that, but just doesn't seem to have much positive going. Well, in the grain markets, February's have tended to be times when we haven't had news yet to come to hit them that uh, would lead to the higher side. Again, we're not really focusing on any crop production issues yet in most of these markets. That's coming in the not-too-distant future. For the major futures contracts that we're watching, again, for corn, for soybeans, and for wheat, they all have March contracts that go off the board at the end of February. And And in the absence of any strong export news, strong usage numbers otherwise, or crop problems elsewhere in the world, you come to the end of February, that March contract is going off the board. People uh, that had short contracts deliver against the futures, and that that pressure tends to drive the markets down. And I I think that's a good part of what's happened when you look at a market analysis and the and we talk about the number of contracts delivered against the March contracts for again, corn, wheat, and, and soybeans, and it makes sense. It's more of a technical weakness as opposed to supply and demand fundamentals? I think it's technical action based on lack of any compelling positive supply demand fundamentals at this time. You know, just around the corner, after this time of delivery, and then we'll start to pay attention to the well, well in the wheat markets, the hard red winter wheat markets, we'll, we'll be paying attention to potential winter damage, winter uh, freeze damage on, on wheat that wasn't covered. Uh, we'll be uh, starting to pay attention more to wet soil conditions, uh, the possibility of, of delayed field work, uh, again, lack of fertilizer being applied delayed preparations for corn planting in Kansas, of course, but also off in other states. And again, anymore, we're, we're planting corn in April as much as, as in May. So April, about 30 days away or so, and, and uh, we've got snow drifts all over the place. <laughs> and when you look at the weather maps that are available, and we've got a number of, of these in our weekly notes uh, to look at, you see uh, an awful lot of moisture all, well, basically covering all of Iowa, a uh, good chunk of southern Wisconsin, Minnesota, et cetera. Illinois itself has to the, on the northern part and the southern part covered, but not not so much right in the heart of it. But then heading off to the east, further, you've got parts of Indiana, Ohio, uh, Kentucky, uh, Michigan, all having quite a bit of moisture, and uh, not to mention what's up in Nebraska. So we'll have production concerns that will start to be in the focus lens of the of the markets and. Again, February, all we see right now is, gosh, exports haven't been doing very well. And with that, we uh, have tended to go to the downside. 
You bring up exports, though there might be one exception, as of the latest data anyway, and that would be on the soybean side, where prospects have been picking up of late? Uh, yes. Uh, the week ending February the 21st, we had a little over 83 million bushels of exports out of U.S. ports to uh, actual shipments out of U.S. ports to major buyers. And, and of course, that's welcome, surely better than, than we what we had been seeing uh, uh, when the uh, trade tariffs were applied to China over the last several months. And we've been waiting for this date for about two or three months, especially since we heard that the USDA announced that they were going to release all the backlog trade data for uh, not just shipments, but forward purchases on the 28th yesterday's number. So we've been waiting for that to happen in the markets, and it uh, came out that if you look at, at each one, just clicking right down them, that we've got, well, with about 25 or 52 weeks done in the corn market, which is about 48% of the way through, we have forward purchases now of about 1.55, 1.56 billion bushels, which is about 63, 64% of the 2.45 that the USDA has been projecting. So arguably in positive shape in terms of what, what's on the books to be bought down the line. We're trailing a little bit at about just a little over a billion bushels in terms of actual shipments. But, again, the question is, well, can we catch up to that? And, and uh, yes, we can, no doubt, just a matter of what prospects for crops that we have available elsewhere in the world, and a lot of that's in South America. For grain sorghum, we do have purchases of about 29 million bushels have shipped about 25 or so so far. Again, the USDA had projected 100 million bushels. It seems that buyers in the grain sorghum uh, market have gone almost have gone hand to mouth. We just don't see a lot of forward purchases, uh, mainly because the supplies are there probably to be had when they want them. So they're not fighting hand over fist to to get to it. In the wheat market, now that these numbers have come out, we see that here we're about uh, 73% of the, of the way through that market here, about 38 out of 52 weeks. And we've uh, had purchases of U.S. wheat of about eight, little over 800 million bushels, about 80%, 81% of the way through the USDA's 1 billion bushel projection. And we're, again, 73 or so percent of the way through the market here. So as much as uh, we've been bemoaning the fact of slow wheat exports, that's not a bad number. Exports for the week of uh, ending the 21st were 24, 25 million bushels, and we need about 14 to keep up the pace. So, gosh, for all that's been happening uh, that we see it's bad in the futures markets for wheat, gosh, here we're having some weeks of actual shipments that aren't that bad. So, mm-hmm. anyway, and when you look at, again, on the soybean side, we talked about that a little bit earlier, forward purchases of about 1.4 billion bushels. That's about 76% of the way to the USDA's projection, about 1.875. And, and again, we're just a little under half the way through the market here. So again, not not the worst of what could happen. The big issue, of course, for soybeans would be uh, you know, when quantities of South American crops would be available to compete against that. At that time, you know, the U.S. would uh, have to compete dollar for dollar, dollar against dollar, or currency against currency, I guess, with, with Brazil. And at that time, we're at risk to slowing down. So to bring these numbers together, and uh, it's not as if there haven't been any purchases of, of our crops uh, that are coming out of the U.S. It's just more a matter of that there's not any outstanding surprise out there that's really driving gangbusters shipments. We have had shipments. It's just not the type of shipments you've seen if you had a had the crop flooded out in Argentina, uh, dried out in Brazil, or, or froze out over in the Black Sea region. Well, one additional item in our visit this week, and you, you cite this as an interesting element in the markets. You're looking at the carry in the trades, and uh, you're actually zeroing in on the carry in the wheat market. What is going on there that's caught your attention? Well, the uh, carry from the, of course, the March contract now is entered delivery, so very little carry there between March and May. But heading from May into July, we've got about just a little over four cents per bushel carry. September, just a little under six. From D's to March, just a little over five cents per bushel. From March to May, five cents per bushel. We had been seeing eight and nine cents a bushel for upfront contracts especially from uh, those November contracts on for a good while in the market. And now we're, we're down below that. In fact, uh, the carries for wheat for uh, Kansas hardwood winter wheat futures are less uh, for the upfront contracts than we see in soybeans. 
which in our heyday of of, of exports in the soybean market, gosh, we didn't even have carries. Right. <laughs> so now the the carries in beans are more than for wheat, and I think that has to do with. Uh, Again, the huge carryover we have in the soybean market waiting for something to happen there. Corn market carries, again, about from the March to May contract, just a, a little over four cents. Again, we're in delivery for March, but from May to July, four cents a bushel, and then falling off into September down to about three per month, and then uh, about two from September to December. So it looks like the market's rewarding some storage yet out into the into spring, midsummer, but then not much after that. And maybe that's an acknowledgement of risk to come uh, in terms of what the crop might might bring, et cetera. So I look at all those, and again, you've got Dees corn sitting at 392, November beans at 943 on yesterday's closes, uh, July at 453. Okay prices, but really nothing of any great, terrible concern about the size of U.S. crops that might come or any, any, any weather issues that are in play yet. It would seem that a lot of the worry that the market will have to deal with with regard to production prospects in the U.S. and the spring and summer of 2019 are right in front of us. And the price action we've just seen has, has a lot to do with people just getting out of, that, out of the March contracts and getting themselves ready to, to take on what could happen once weather starts to be a big factor in the markets. Well, all of what we've discussed here is detailed fully in those aforementioned notes that Dan posts weekly on the grain trades and the influencing factors at agmanager.info. Enjoy your weekend, Dan. Many thanks. Thanks, Eric. Take care. He is grain market economist Dan O'Brien of K-State Research and Extension. Dan is based in Colby, northwest Kansas. While you're at that agmanager.info website, have a look at the interactive crop basis tool that K-State agricultural economists routinely maintain for you. It's an interactive tool. You can examine historical weekly nearby basis for corn, sorghum, soybeans, wheat, That can be quite useful as you go about your grain marketing decisions. Look for it right there in the center of the page at agmanager.info. We'll be back after this here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and next up for you, a topic that is certainly on the minds of any number of livestock producers out there as this winter has dragged on and on and on. It's been a cold one and a wet one, and that has really wreaked havoc with our livestock feeding areas around the state. We'll talk about the consequences of that, and uh, once the opportunity does present itself, what you producers might do to renovate those feeding sites. Joel DeRushi is with us, a livestock specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Joel, the problem is you just have to, as a livestock producer, access these sites, no matter what the conditions, to get that feed to those animals. That's absolutely right, Eric. And it's been, uh, as everybody knows, and we don't have to reiterate how tough a winter it's been for all of us uh, feeding cattle in particular out. And as we kind of maybe break this into two segments, we kind of have our cow-calf or even some of the backgrounding that's done more in a pasture-based setting. The biggest thing is is just getting those animals fed. Uh, I mean, we can talk about the ideal situations and where to feed, and we've done that in the past. Uh, the conditions we're in today is, is we just need to get them fed, which primarily means we're feeding in the morning when it's still frozen. Again, some days we're not getting above freezing, but again, we just need to make sure that we're getting the ample feed out to the locations that we can get into those pastures, get into those feeding areas, wherever those cattle are housed this time of year under that system. And so the one thing that comes with that too is, again, how we provide that feed. And again, for many cases, if we're using round bales or in particular and rolling them out, you know, we we just got to make sure that we're matching the amount of feed 
to what those cattle need. And in coming off of now a couple months of pretty high stress, especially cows that um, are spring calving, cows that maybe have already dropped calves and or are going to be making sure that we're providing enough nutrition for them to account for the normal, but then the extra stress that we've went through under these conditions, both in the cold and from the mud. And that's where one has to practice their good stewardship in their feeding management. And you, as well as other colleagues in animal science, have stressed the balanced ration and quality feedstuffs, even to the point of the hay supplies we have coming out of last year that have been a bit suspect here and there. The hay, and, and that's where we, we talk about uh, understanding what the nutritional value of the feed that you're providing because we all recognize that prairie hay is not prairie hay year to year depending on the conditions and when it was put up in particular. Brome is the same, and as we go through any of the, the forages, uh, what we're finding is, and there's many reports in Kansas and other states as well, that some of the hay quality is certainly not as high as what we've had in the, in past years. And when we think about feeding a certain amount to your those same cattle that you have year in, year out, this is a particular year that many producers have had to adjust the amount up to maintain body condition, even without all the additional weather issues, because some, in a lot of places, and especially if you've had to purchase hay in, different things, the hay quality this year just seems not to have the nutrients and energy in it, in some cases as we've had in the past. So we need to make sure we're keeping a mindful eye on our body condition, because again, not only are these cows that have calved and are, we are have to be thinking about the breed backs this spring. And so every time that we're shorting the nutrition, and so there's the, the hay and protein side that we need to make sure is balanced. But in particular, we need to keep the vitamins and minerals and salt in front of those cattle. Again, they're lethargic. They're not wanting to move around a lot. You know, in the past, we talk about having the salt and mineral in different places to make those cattle get out and move and spread that manure out. And those are all very practical things things, I guess I would suggest we just need to have those in very accessible places that we're not limiting them uh, in their ability to get to those and, and consume ample amounts. Where these cows are just under so much stress, we need to provide everything we can to them, not only to survive right now, but that we do not affect reproduction of these cows and heifers uh, as we get into the spring and early summer when we try to get them bred. Again, though, out in these open feeding areas, the same site over and over again with heavy equipment, taking big bales out, taking supplement out. You're uh, likely rutting up those areas. So logistically moving slightly elsewhere so they're not tromping around in the recurring slop. Yes, and we generally always would like those sites to move. You know, the higher areas where we have more drainage, it's going to be muddy on every location, but we recognize that some areas are going to certainly dry out faster than others. And, you know, the south side where we get some sunshine in particular, mm -hmm. the drainage areas, utilizing those as much as possible so those cattle have some relief, staying out of the low-lying areas, especially that have the trees and shade or on the north side of hills that stay frozen, don't get as, uh, as much sunshine to dry out. All those little things cumulatively add up to provide a better feeding site. And especially if we're providing supplements and you don't have adequate bunk space or don't have any bunks, we're just putting that on the ground. Again, we really have to be careful that we're providing that, you know, at least in a potentially in a pellet form, something that they can consume because we are providing a large amount of waste, whether it's visual or not, there's significant wastage at times. And so what we have to do is provide amounts that they're going to clean up and be hungry to clean up. When we put out excess hay, excess supplement, we are significantly increasing our losses just due to those animals tromping it into the ground. And thus, are what we think we're delivering, they're not consuming. Now, the other scenario, Joel, and that is feeding cattle, other livestock as well, in confined lots where the mud really accumulates. And if you have any sort of drainage problem in those lots, it's even more aggravated. We talk quite frequently on this show in the past, and producers recognize when you have those confined lots, we we have to get them to drain. And some lots uh, historically have been set up, you know, it just depends on your uh, geography. If you have some slope from where your pens are, in many cases there's very little slope. 
But even in those cases, by creating mounds, and, and mounds become so important, especially this time of year, it gives those cattle an opportunity to get out of the bottom uh, where things get really deep and muddy and, and get some elevated uh, where there's additional drainage. One thing that we run into this time of year, if you have an apron, a concrete apron, or something that's solid in that feeding area behind, again, we recognize that's generally manure buildup, and we should be able to scrape and remove that. So then we provide an area that those cattle can easily stand um, without the stress of, again, knee-high, hawk-high, mud slash manure when there's a solid apron, and those can be cleaned off and removed. The one thing that gets a challenge is, is is these pens are extremely wet right now and will be this spring. Sometimes it's our tendency, and, and rightfully so, to go in and start to scrape and remove some of that heavy mud-type material. But we got to recognize that a lot of that is actually soil. It's just not manure. And so because we're tromping down and have a deep uh, we lose our base of that feedlot surface. When we start digging in and removing that, we're removing a significant portion of dirt, which will cause us low areas and cutouts as we get into when it does dry. So something to think about is if that material is removed, some of that material can be replaced back into the pens and recognize it's just not all manure. If we did a good job cleaning last fall, again, and shape those lots, we need to think about does some of that material could be brought in or in particular just mounded up. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that depends on your stocking density, all the different things of how much manures accumulate over the last couple months. But just be cautious that we're not removing too much material and not utilizing it to help build the low areas and reshape uh, those pens so we do have good drainage. And I think right now pens that don't have good drainage, we need to recognize how we fix that problem as much as feasibly possible once those lots dry out again this spring. And to that point, that fix will vary with the layout, of course. But there are general principles of drainage, and K-State has information and publications toward that end that producers can reference and uh, maybe reassess where they're at with their feedlot layout. Yes, you know, your, your local extension um, agriculture agents can help provide assistance. We have a number of beef specialists uh, and watershed specialists that spend a lot of time with producers of all sizes. And so if you have questions about lot design and, and drainage, those are things that we can provide assistance with to help. But again, just recognizing anything we can do to pull moisture out of those from a drainage standpoint, we really need to evaluate. And so whether that's reshifting dirt around in existing pens, and again, just I, I've talked about but the importance of good mounds to get those cattle up and not just stay in those low aspects and keeping a, that feeding area, that apron, cleaned off as much as possible to provide a nice area, that a lower stress area so those cattle want to get up to the bunk and consume feed to help with their growth because we recognize with everything that's been happening, the growth and feed efficiency of our confined animals is, is really suffering. And so anything we can do to aid in that to help our bottom line profitability-wise, especially from a feed efficiency and gain standpoint of those cattle, is certainly required right now. Well, the muddy slop has put a strain on cattle, on producers as well. It'll all come to an end at some point. But for the here and now, particularly when the thaw comes, Producers will be contending with these sloppy conditions for a time, so we hope that they'll take all of this into account moving forward. Joel, thank you very much for coming over today and imparting a few important thoughts here. Thank you, Eric. And again, for producers, anything we can do from our extension uh, service base, both at a county and state level, please let us know, and we would be more than willing to help you any way possible. Very good. Joel DeRussi with us, Livestock Specialist with K-State Research and Extension, and we'll return with more after these moments away. You're listening to Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu.
Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today and Eric Atkinson here. Checking on today's agricultural news headlines now, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, the World Trade Organization has ruled in favor of the U.S. in its cases against China's domestic price supports for wheat, corn, and rice, policies our nation says has kept grain exports out of China. The USDA's Rod Bain reports. The chief ag negotiator of the U.S. Trade Representative's office, Greg Dowd, perhaps offered some foreshadowing about a World Trade Organization case against China during last week's USDA Agricultural Outlook Forum. We're going to see the results of that here very soon, I think, with regard to how that's going to work out for us. And on Thursday, a WTO dispute settlement panel announced its ruling in favor of the U.S. and its case against China's domestic supports for its grain producers. When it comes to wheat, rice, and corn, we think China has exceeded what it was allowed to do when it became a member of the WTO by somewhere in the neighborhood of, what, $80, $100 billion? while exceeding its commitments under WTO rules. The U.S. in its case claims these supports have limited American wheat, corn, and rice exports from entering into the Chinese marketplace. As Ambassador Dowd noted, this particular case... We have what our general counsel thinks is probably the biggest WTO case in history. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Now, Senate Agriculture Committee Chairman Pat Roberts of Kansas credited U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and his team, including Greg Dowd, for standing up for U.S. farmers, quoting the senator, We play by international trade rules and must ensure other nations do too. Especially now, he went on to say, our farmers and ranchers need greater access to new and growing markets. This action will allow them to better compete in China. In the senator's words, U.S. Wheat Associates also welcoming the decision and pointed to an Iowa State University study funded by the wheat industry that showed China's domestic support price for wheat was nearly $10 per bushel, which cost wheat farmers as much as $700 million in income here in the U.S. because of lost exports to China. There are more signs that beef cattle herd expansion may be ending this year. That's according to the just-released USDA cattle inventory report. More on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. 2018 was the fifth year in a row of beef cattle herd expansion. However, now we're beginning to see potential signs. Signs? So that we may be peaking out in terms of the of the expansion of the herd. USDA livestock analyst Shea Oshagami says the signs are in Thursday's cattle inventory report. Now, yes, it does show a 1% increase from a year ago in beef cow numbers, but... We are looking at uh, beef cow replacement numbers, which were down 3%. So while producers were holding more beef cows on the 1st, they were intending to bring fewer heifers into the beef cow herd during the year. However, the number of so-called other heifers not designated as to how they'll be used, that number's up 3% at 9.6 million head, making those animals the swing factor. They could be put in feedlots during the year, but if conditions warranted, some of those animals could be held back by producers. So Shackham says most signs point to the beef herd expansion coming to an end in 2019, but there's still a little bit of doubt. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And a clear line was drawn between those who support and those who oppose the proposed revision of the Waters of the U.S. or WOTUS rule during an EPA public hearing held in Kansas City yesterday. Agriculture and other industry interests came out in support of the rule that they say will provide more certainty for farmers and ranchers and make it easier for water-challenged regions to complete important drinking water projects. On the flip side, concerns were raised by environmental health and public interest group representatives that lifting federal protections for isolated wetlands and some streams would have a detrimental effect on drinking water. Now, according to the new rule, only wetlands that are adjacent to jurisdictional waters would be considered to be a water of the U.S., essentially removing isolated wetlands from jurisdiction. In addition, the new rule would continue to consider impoundments as jurisdictional. The EPA launching that 60-day public comment period on the rule, that comment period expires on April the 15th. On we go now to this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. And with that, Mary Marsh. Mary? Between sports, clubs, volunteering, studying for the ACT and the SAT, part-time jobs, chores at home, and just plain homework, most Kansas high school seniors are working toward building foundations for their future. Soon, 
the agricultural industry will need these vibrant young men and women to step up and take their reins for the future. For now, though, these students are making plans for college, and more importantly, how to pay for it. High school seniors pursuing careers in agriculture are encouraged to apply for the 2019 Herb Clutter Memorial Scholarship. The Herb Clutter Memorial Scholarship was established in 2009 to honor Herb Clutter's influential role in organizing leadership groups on behalf of Kansas wheat producers and is administered by the Kansas Association of Wheat Growers. The scholarship fund will award one $500 scholarship per year to a college or university-bound incoming freshman from Kansas pursuing a career in the field of agriculture. To be eligible for the scholarship, applicants must plan to be a full-time student at any two- or four-year Kansas college or university. Recipients will be selected based on academic achievement, leadership qualities, and career objectives focused around the field of agriculture. Recipients will receive the scholarship to be applied toward tuition for the student's college or university education. The scholarship is non-renewable. The Herb Clutter Memorial Scholarship was established through a fund in memory of Herbert W. Clutter, a farmer from Holcomb and the first president of the National Association of Wheat Growers, which was established in 1948. Clutter encouraged Kansas wheat farmers to organize as a strong, unified voice, which led to the formation of the Kansas Association of Wheat Growers in 1952. He encouraged research in education and industrial uses of wheat, improved variety development, and methods to produce the best product at the lowest cost. Clutter's efforts led to the formation of the Kansas Wheat Commission by the Kansas Legislature in 1957. Applicants of the Herb Clutter Memorial Scholarship must complete the scholarship application, which includes a 400 to 500 word essay discussing why they have chosen to pursue a career in agriculture. The selection committee will use this essay along with the student's application in determining the scholarship winner. The scholarship and attached documents must be submitted to the Kansas Association of Wheat Growers at 1990 Kimball Avenue, Manhattan, Kansas, by March 15, 2019. For more information about the Herb Clutter Memorial Scholarship, please go to kansaswheat.com. For Kansas Wheat, this is Mary Marsh. Thanks, Mary. Today, we've a modest respite from the cold weather of late, but it won't last. Mary Knapp will tell us more next on Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day -day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. This agriculture today concludes on Kansas agricultural weather and the uncooperative conditions that we continue to endure here in this state. Mary Knapp is along once more, climatologist with K-State Research and Extension. Before we talk about what's ahead, let's look back. The month of February is now in the books. You've your recap numbers and the simple description should surprise absolutely no one. It was colder and wetter than normal, you tell us, Mary. Right. The northwest uh, was the dry spot. They averaged 63% of their normal precipitation. Keep in mind that means a deficit of less than a quarter of an inch. And when we look at the fall season, they're still um, over two, uh, 2.3 inches wetter than normal for the fall. So even though they're dry for February, they're not really dry. If we look at the wet side of the scale, the North Central Division averaged 118 percent of normal, and they have a surplus of about 1,500 of an inch. But that adds up 
to their 7.32 inches of surplus for the fall season. Mm -hmm. And those numbers follow that pattern across most of the state. The other area on the dry side is the south central and the southeast. Again, less than a half an inch deficit for those areas, which is a, a single thunderstorm would make that up very quickly, which is why it's no surprise that there is no drought in the state at the current time. And it would be easy to forget that the month of February started out fairly warm and then changed quickly and didn't go back. Right. Um, We did have uh, the start of the month uh, temperatures in the upper 60s to as much as 80 degrees. We had an 81 down in southwestern Kansas on the fourth of the month. And so our highest temperatures uh, ranged from, again, the 67 in the north central to uh, the 81 in the southwest, uh, all of them on the either the third or the fourth of the month. And then we went to cold temperatures. And actually, much of the coldest readings were right in that same week on the 8th. Most of the areas, 8th and 9th, were the dates for the lows. And we're talking minus 6, minus 2, minus 7. The eastern divisions were in the single digits rather than the sub-zero, but were, again, still well below what we would normally see at this time of the year. And, again, we look at uh, the departures from almost 10 degrees cooler than normal to just under four degrees cooler than normal in the southeast. So, again, very, very cool. Not looking at any change in this pattern anytime soon. This is a seemingly never-ending winter, and uh, the forecast perpetuates that idea. Right, Uh, and it's been like a a weekly basis getting these winter storms. We've got another one on tap for this weekend. Uh, They've already put out winter weather advisories or winter storm watches for a good portion of the state. And even in the areas where those advisories are not yet in place, they are expecting cold temperatures, snow, and a lot of wind, uh, which is, again, not what is needed at this time. Mm-hmm. Snowfall totals are looking as much as uh, six inches of snow in, in different parts of the state. And again, that can, that number can change as the storm actually makes its way out into our area and starts interacting with the moisture that that's coming in from the south. Doesn't look like it's going to be as prolific in the liquid as the last system was. Looks like it's going to be mostly snow across all of the area. Uh, here in Manhattan, we had 81 hundredths of an inch of rain before it converted to snow. It doesn't look like we're going to get anywhere near that. But again, we don't really need anything near that. And then looking beyond into the new week, we're going to have starkly cold temperatures, followed by what, a very, very modest warm-up? Right. We're looking at highs in the single digits, which is not the way that you would like to start March. Um, It does look like it'll be dry and sunny, which will make it feel a little bit better, but it'll still be windy. When we talk about warm-up, we're talking warm-up into the above-freezing range, but keep in mind that the normal highs for much of the state at this time are in the mid-50s, so 50 to 55 degrees, and even warmer if you get to the south, so a high of 35 is not going to be warmer than normal. Yeah, way short of the norm. And in fact, the first half of the month of March, you tell us, will be roughly more of the same. Right. Um, the Climate Prediction Center's 8 to 14 day outlook, which carries us through just about the middle of March, is strongly tilted towards colder than normal temperatures. It doesn't say how much colder they are going to be, but they're looking at an 80 to 90 percent chance of colder than normal. So um, again, everything is in play for this cold to continue. And of course, given the fact that this is another round of adding snow to the ground, that snow makes it more difficult for those temperatures to moderate, to warm up. You, You get stuck in that colder pattern. We don't know how the end of the month is going to fare. The 
month outlook is for cooler than normal. But again, we're heavily waiting the beginning of the month to the cold side. So we could, uh, towards the end of the month, see a shift in the pattern and have it move more into our normal temperature scenario. On the moisture side, they are also slightly tilting towards wetter than normal for March. And even more interesting is if we look at the March, April, May outlook, while the temperature goes equal chances, it's equally likely to be colder or warmer than normal, the precipitation outlook continues to show that wetter than normal scenario into April and May. Not exactly what we would like to see. We've got a lot of field work to catch up on because they were um, delayed by the wet conditions in the fall. Um, Very little has been accomplished so far this winter and into the spring. So a wet pattern, particularly if it's coupled with colder temperatures, that'll mean slow uh, drying on the fields and a slow start to the field season. By all accounts, an inordinate late arrival of spring. So we will eagerly await it whenever it shows up. And Mary... Thanks. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Eric. Mary Knapp along with us, climatologist with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks to you as well for joining us and take care and precautions in these forthcoming conditions over the weekend. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.